Number five. This is the last haunting self-portrait of Andrew McCauley, a man in his kayak alone, all around a vast seascape of emptiness. On January 11, 2007, seasoned adventurer, 39-year-old Andrew McCauley, set out on his quest to become the first person to kayak from Australia to New Zealand across 1,600 kilometers of one of the wildest and loneliest expanses of ocean on Earth the southern ocean stretch of the Tasman Sea below the 40th parallel, an area known for tumultuous and punishing weather conditions. Andrew started his journey from Fort Esk Bay, expecting to arrive in Milford Sound, New Zealand, on the 8th of February, 2007. Before this quest, Andrew spent nearly 10 years preparing for the trip. He completed three crossings from Australia to Tasmania via the notorious Bass Strait, as well as a solo seven-day traverse of Australia's treacherous Gulf of Carpentaria, earning him Australian Geographic's 2005 Adventure of the Year Award. Before catching the kayaking bug on a late 1990s trip in the Chilean Fjords, Andrew devoted his considerable energies to mountaineering, making first ascents in Pakistan, Patagonia, and Australia. On Thursday, February 8th, with only 120 kilometers to go, he sent a triumphant text message to his wife, Vicky, and three-year-old son, Finlay, who were already waiting in New Zealand. See you 9 a.m. Sunday. The weather forecast promised a benign end to a harrowing journey. Vicky and Finlay gathered with friends and family in Milford Sound to celebrate. The legendary sea kayaker Paul Caffin would be there in person to congratulate the man who accomplished what he'd failed to do. Caffin told ABC Radio, We were planning to paddle out and wait there until Andrew came in with a bottle of whiskey and ginger beer. At 7 p.m. on Friday, February the 9th, New Zealand Coast Guard received an almost indecipherable transmission on Channel 16 from a vessel identifying itself as Kayak One. Uh, I'm 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 Andrew's family suspected the radio message was a hoax, or perhaps an attempt by Andrew to make his nightly check-in by radio now that his sat phone batteries were dead. A small search was launched, but nobody really believed Andrew could be in trouble. A full-scale search began. Planes combed 25,000 square kilometers of wind-tossed ocean. On Saturday night, Rescue Coordination Center New Zealand found Andrew's upturned kayak in near-perfect condition just 54 kilometers offshore of Milford Sound. It was missing only the cockpit canopy, a bulbous fiberglass capsule dubbed Casper. It was presumed to have been torn off by a freak wave. One of its pivot arms had already been damaged. The paddle, satellite phone, GPS, and emergency position indicating radio beacon, EPIRB, not activated, were all in working order inside the kayak. His video camera was also recovered, but unfortunately, Andrew is nowhere to be found. At a coroner's inquest held in Inver Cargill, his wife Vicky said she believed her husband had been capsized in his kayak by a rogue wave and the protective fiberglass pod used to seal his kayak while he was sleeping, which had been damaged days earlier, filled with water, making it difficult to write. Coroner Trevor Savage's findings confirmed it was likely Andrew became separated from his kayak after a freak wave capsized it. Andrew would have drowned before hypothermia set in, Savage said. Andrew's January departure from Tasmania was his second attempt he set out in December, but turned back after just 48 hours when he found his sleeping arrangement to be too cold. After some modifications, 
he launched a second time. Andrew took a video camera with him to record his progress, but he ended up recording his last words, expressing excitement and fear about attempting the 1,600-kilometer voyage. In his final days, as he floated alone in the Tasman Sea, Andrew conceded that he may have pushed the boundaries too far. This really is extreme. It's full on. It's full on. I really could die. I mean, it's an excellent adventure, providing I make it. I've got a lot of people that want me back, Andrew said in one of his videos. I've got a great family. Even though it was his choice, Andrew struggled emotionally with his kayaking expedition. Alone, exposed, and physically exhausted, he frequently implied he was distraught over his circumstances. I just hope I haven't bitten off more than I can chew, he bemoaned. Right now I just want it to be over, to be truthfully honest, he said in another video. Number 4 This is one of the last photos of Chris Creamers and Lizanne Froon before they went missing after hiking in El Pinesta Trail near the well-known town Boquette, located in the Panamanian province, Chiriqui, close to the border to Costa Rica. Based on the photographs that they have taken, they seem so happy at the beginning of the hike as they smile for a series of photos. But as they went deep to the jungle, something happened, and they called for help a couple of hours later. Chris, 21, and Lizanne, 22, grew up in Amherst Fort in the province of Utrecht, Netherlands. Lizanne had just graduated with a degree in applied sciences, and Chris with a degree in cultural social education. The two women met whilst working at the N. Den Kleinen Hop restaurant in Amsterdam and they both rented rooms in the same student house. As their friendship got stronger, Chris and Lizanne planned for a trip to Panama as a reward to Lizanne for graduating. Both of them saved all their money for this special trip. Six months later, on March 15, 2014, they got on a plane at Amsterdam Airport to travel to Costa Rica. From there, they traveled to Bocos del Toro in Panama. They spent some time on the coast, learning some Spanish and enjoying the local food and drink. They met two Dutchmen who were visiting the area at the time. Two weeks after arriving in Panama, on March 29th, they moved on Boquette, a city on the west side of the country. They had originally planned to teach local children in a school on Boquette, but when they arrived at the school, the staff told them they were one week too early that they could not work there yet. Disappointed, they decided to stay with the local host family in the area of Alto Boquette. To make their moods better, the girls booked several excursions that week, including one to the Finca Las Princesas, where strawberries were farmed, among other things. They also booked a guided hike tour to the local volcano with a local guide. At 11 a.m. on April 1, 2014, Chris and Lizanne waved goodbye to their host family and set out for a hike on a hiking trail known as Sendero El Pianista with the family dog named Blue. Later that night, the family dog returned home without Chris and Lizanne. The family searched the area surrounding their home but found no signs of the girls. Giving them the benefit of the doubt, the host family decided they would wait until morning and continue their search. Since their arrival in Panama, the girls regularly sent text messages to their families on a daily basis. Lizanne's parents stopped receiving messages from her on April 1st. When the girls missed an appointment with the local guide on the morning of April 2nd, their host family contacted the authorities who conducted aerial searches of the area. Additionally, local residents searched for the girls as well. On April 6th, the girls' parents arrived in Boquette along with police, dog units, and detectives from the Netherlands to conduct a full-scale, 10-day search of the jungle. The parents also offered a 30,000 USD reward for information. After 10 weeks and no sign of the girls, police began to slow their search efforts. 
but it was then that a Nagobi woman found Lizanne's blue backpack in a rice paddy by a riverbank near her village of Alto Romero in the Bocos del Toro region and turned it over to the police. The woman claimed it had not been there the day before. Inside the backpack, authorities found two pairs of sunglasses, Lizanne's passport, a water bottle, two bras, and $83 in cash. All the items were dry and in good condition. Heavy rain had hit the area in the prior few weeks, so it would be expected that everything would be soaked through, suggesting it had been placed there prior to its discovery by persons unknown. Many different fingerprints and sets of DNA were detected on the backpack contents, but none led to any serious leads for the police. But that wasn't all. The backpack also contained Lizanne's camera and both of the girls' cell phones, Chris's Apple iPhone and Lizanne's Samsung Galaxy. Immediately investigating the phones and cameras, police were shocked to find out that the phones had remained in service for nearly 10 days after the girls disappeared. Over the course of four days, there were 77 attempts to contact the police via 112, the emergency number in the Netherlands, and 911, the emergency number in Panama. The first two calls were to the 112 emergency number and came just hours after Chris and Lizanne set out on their hike at 4.39 p.m. to be more accurate. Unfortunately, due to the dense jungle, neither call went through. In fact, out of all 77 calls, only one managed to get through, but it broke up after only two seconds. Additionally, police discovered that on April 6th, there were several attempts, all unsuccessful, to unlock Chris's iPhone with an incorrect PIN number. The phone battery had completely died by April 11th. Whoever was trying to access the phone never succeeded, and the phone remained locked until it was in police hands. Next, police went to investigate Lizanne's Canon PowerShot SX270 camera. In it, there were 133 consecutive photos taken by them during their trek, which offered some clues as to what happened. From those consecutive photos, one mystery shot is missing. The first pictures on April 1st were standard tourist shots, with both women laughing and smiling on a bright sunny day with some selfies taken at the overlook of the divide. Most of the pictures were taken by Lizanne with Chris walking ahead of her on the trail. The last few images in this first set indicated the girls had left the Pianista and likely crossed over to the other side of the divide. There, a network of trails exist that are not maintained by rangers or guides. Trails used almost exclusively by tribes of indigenous people living within the forests. This included the Nagobi people, whose village was approximately 12 hours by foot from the Continental Divide and where the girl's backpack was found. The last photos that were taken by them that day are images 507 and 508, which show Chris crossing a small creek. The next photo, 509, is missing. Dutch specialists have tried to undelete the missing photo, which normally is not a challenge when an image is manually deleted because pressing the delete button does not mean the whole file is actually erased. However, experts failed to find the missing photo and it would be impossible for the camera to skip a number by accident when shooting photos. Did someone connect the camera to a computer and erase the photo to make it irretrievable? Investigators believe that someone deliberately deleted it for some reason and with the help of a computer and since it is between the normal daytime photos of April 1st and the mysterious night photos of April 8th, it could be a very important shot. Of all the holiday photos the two ladies made on their holiday, investigators did not find any deleted photos. In addition, the memory card had plenty of space left. The emergency services calls started around this time. Coincidence, maybe? But probably not. The travel channels lost in the wild on the disappearance of Chris and Lizanne and JJ and Kinga, the presenters, showed in a simple manner that if Chris and Lizanne had removed photo 509 manually any time before the first nighttime photo was made, we would have never even known that it had been deleted because the next photo, aka the first nighttime photo, would have automatically received photo number 509. The strangest pictures on the camera, and perhaps of most interest, 
were 90 flash photos taken on April 8th between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. after both women were already pronounced missing. Many of these photos being dark and nothing apparently visible. Some taken a few seconds apart and others up to 15 minutes later. Most notably are photos showing deep jungle wilderness in rain, a twig with what looks like plastic bags tied to them with wrappers on a rock. Another perhaps is a paper with some writings on it that has been torn into pieces on a rock with a mirror or reflective object. The most alarming sight, however, was the back of Chris's head with blood spilling from her temple. After the discovery of the backpack, new searches began along the Culebra Serpent River. Two Nagobi women from a search party found Chris's jean shorts on top of a rock on the opposite bank of the tributary, a few kilometers away from where Lizanne's backpack was found. The shorts were zipped and neatly folded. The discovery of the shorts prompted a new search along the Calibra River. Two months later, close to the location of the backpack, a hiking boot with a foot, femur, and tibia still inside was found along with part of a pelvis and rib bone behind a tree. DNA testing confirmed the bones belonged to Chris Creamers and Lizanne Froon. The boot and partial leg foot belonged to Lizanne. The pelvis and rib belonged to Chris. Lizanne's remains still had some flesh and skin attached to the bones. However, Chris's remains were bleached, possibly due to sunlight or by phosphorus, a substance absent from the local non-volcanic soil. Their cause of death was never determined. Panamanian authorities concluded that Chris and Lizanne both fell off a monkey bridge and were washed away. But in a documentary called Lost in the Wild, J.J. and Kinga tried to hike the trail that Chris and Lizanne took. They went there at the same time the girls started their hike at 11 a.m. At the beginning of the hike, they discovered that there are some houses along the trail, and they are not that alone. They also pointed out that it's a one-way trail. There is no way to get lost. At 1.05 p.m., they arrive at the end of the Pianista Trail, the same time as Chris and Lizanne's arrival at the summit. Kinga and JJ also decided to continue to the trail where the girls supposedly went. Normally, tourists don't go there as there is a clear sign not to continue further. At 4.39 p.m., Kinga and JJ arrived in an area still hours away from the Monkey Bridge. 4.39 p.m. was the time Chris and Lizanne made their distress call for help. It seemed that they didn't even go that far. Additionally, Chris's parents also went to the trail to get an idea of what really happened to their daughter and her friend. They discovered that there's actually a second creek 20 minutes after the first one where Chris was last pictured. They wondered why Chris and Lizanne did not take more pictures as the spot is beautiful. They found it so strange and decided to hike until the end of the trail where they arrived in a beautiful field. Chris's parents don't believe they even went this far, and if they did, they would have taken more pictures. If Chris and Lizanne would have decided to come back to the Pianista Trail, they could easily have done so. According to Chris's mother, you really have to try hard to get lost here. They also stated that they didn't see a single cliff or anything else one could fall or slip into. It's really a mystery. Chris's parents think that between this field and the small creek where the last photo of Chris was taken, something happened. Chris's mother doesn't believe that Chris would have left the path, saying, she's not that stupid. If they somehow had an accident and got injured, they would definitely have stayed on the trail and surely somebody would have seen and rescued them. To this day, the disappearance and deaths of Chris Creamers and Lizanne Froon remain a harrowing mystery. Number three. These screenshot photos from a surveillance camera footage show six-year-old Timothy James Pitson together with his mother, Amy Fry Pitson, it looks to all like a happy and normal scene. A lively young boy jumps up and down and around as his mother waits to check out of a water park resort where they had just spent the night. But the silent video has a deeply eerie feel. For these are the last images of Timothy before he vanished 
and they were shot just hours before his mother booked into a motel in Illinois and killed herself. On May 11, 2011, Timothy's father, James Pitson, dropped him off at Greenman Elementary School in Aurora, Illinois for kindergarten. About 30 minutes later, his mother showed up at the school. She told staff there was a family emergency and she signed out her son. Security footage shows them leaving the school around 8.30 a.m. At home, James Pitson had gone to pick Timothy up at school, only to find that his son was already gone. His wife never answered her cell phone and he reported the two missing. While Amy never answered James' calls, she did check in with her mother. She told her mom they were fine and they'd be home in a day or two. She said she just needed some space. She also called James's brother. She told him as well that everything was fine, but Timothy belongs to me. While friends and family were frantically searching for Amy and Timothy, the mother and son were on a vacation of sorts. They went to a zoo near Chicago, a water park in Gurney, Illinois, and then a resort in Wisconsin. Surveillance footage showed them walking hand in hand. Amy also apparently bought Timothy toys on the trip, including a blue Hot Wheels starter set and pretend gold coins decorated with animals. Timothy was last seen on security camera footage at about 10 a.m. on May 13, 2011, when he and his mom checked out of the Kalahari Resort in Wisconsin. Shortly before 8 p.m. that night, Amy was spotted on surveillance video at a family dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, buying stationery. She was alone. She checked into a hotel at the Rockford Inn around 11.15 p.m. that night. Just after noon the next day, hotel employees found her dead in the room, having overdosed on antihistamines and cut her own wrists and neck. She was 42. At some point, Amy had written two letters, one to her mother, and one to a friend, and an unmarked note saying that Timothy was fine and being cared for. You will never find him, one message said. Police quickly began a huge search for Timothy spanning three states. After they note, they were looking at the possibility she had passed him to other people, or perhaps even killed him and hidden the body. Only her own blood was on the knife used to take her own life. But in August, three months after he went missing, police revealed there was a concerning amount of Timothy's blood on the back seat of Amy's SUV. However, investigators later concluded it was from an earlier nosebleed, keeping hopes alive that Timothy would one day be found safe. James said that Amy had previously survived a suicide attempt and had been taking medication for depression. He said the couple had been arguing before Timothy's disappearance because Amy took a cruise with a friend for her birthday, leaving James behind. James said Amy, who had been divorced three times before, had mentioned splitting up. Years after her death, friends and family speculated in a CNN special that Amy's behavior was based in fear that her history of mental illness might prevent her from getting custody of Timothy if she and James divorced. In April of 2019, a boy told police in Newport, Kentucky, that he had just escaped from two kidnappers that had been holding him for seven years and identified himself as Timothy Pitson, who would now be 14. The boy described two kidnappers as two male, whites, bodybuilder type build. One had black curly hair, a Mountain Dew shirt, and jeans, and has a spiderweb tattoo on his neck. The other was short in stature and had a snake tattoo on his arms. He said he had escaped the men who were driving a car with Wisconsin license plates and ran across a bridge into Kentucky. 24 hours later, the FBI announced that DNA tests showed the boy was not Timothy. In fact, the person claiming to be Timothy is actually 23-year-old Brian Michael Reaney of Medina, Ohio. The whereabouts of Timothy is still a mystery to this day. Number two. Judson Box has never known exactly how his son Gary died on September 11, 2001, but an unexpected find eight years later has given him a glimpse into his son's final hours. Gary, then 37, had been working as a firefighter in Brooklyn for roughly five years when the terrorists attacked. He did not speak to his father the day of the attack 
and his body was never recovered, leaving the circumstances of his death a mystery. He left behind a grieving wife and two children. On September 11, 2009, Gary's sister, Christine, was visiting the Tribute Center when an employee asked her if she was looking for someone specifically. She mentioned her brother, Gary, and the employee showed her a picture of a firefighter in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel that had a caption bearing Gary's name. But it was not Gary. It was a photo of Brian Bilcher, another member of Gary's fire squad who also perished on 9-11. The discovery compelled Gary's father to dig deeper, clinging to the possibility that there could be a similar picture of his son out there. Bach scoured photo archives of the National 9-11 Museum and the memorial's website, which allows users to upload photos from 9-11 directly to the site. After searching one night for more than five hours, Box went to sleep, physically and emotionally exhausted. The next morning, his wife, Helen, called him into the living room as he was eating breakfast. She showed him a photo of a firefighter running through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel toward the towers alongside cars stuck in traffic. This time, it was Gary. Eager for more answers, Box contacted the National 9-11 Museum and Memorial in an attempt to track down the photographer. Several months later, the museum gave him the email address of Eric Trollson, a Danish businessman who was stranded in the tunnel on his way to a meeting when he snapped the picture of Gary. Having entered the tunnel before the first plane hit, Trollson was unaware of the tragedy that was taking place outside. Suddenly, the girl in the car in front of us got out crying, he said. Then we turned on the radio and heard the events as they unfolded. Soon after, fire trucks started racing through the tunnel, but a car with blown out tires jammed traffic, he said. Some of the bigger trucks got stuck, so the guys started walking briskly past us, Trollson said. Gary Box was one of the guys. Number one. This adorable photograph is of William Tyrell, a three-year-old boy who's been missing since 2014. The photograph was the last known photo of William that was taken just moments before he went missing. He was wearing his Spider-Man costume, something he enjoyed dressing up as often. On the 11th of September, 2014, William Tyrell, in the company of his foster parents and his older sister, journeyed from Sydney to Kendall on the north coast of New South Wales. The purpose of the visit was to see William Foster's grandmother whose house sat directly across from the Kendall State Forest. On September 11, 2014, at about 10 to 10.30 a.m., William and his sister were playing hide-and-seek in the front and backyard, while his foster mother and foster grandmother were sitting outside supervising them. His mother left them briefly to make herself a drink inside, but began to worry after William hadn't made any noise for several minutes. She began searching the yard and the house. At close to 11 a.m. on the same day, his foster mother called 000 emergency services to report him missing and the police arrived at 11.06. Thus began the lengthy and unfruitful search for William Tyrell. According to his foster mother, her last memory was that William was imitating a tiger's roar while running towards the side of the home and then there was silence and he had disappeared. Initially, hundreds of emergency service members and members of the public were involved in the search for William. In addition, the police deployed specialist resources to the area like Strike Force Roseanne, a group of specially trained investigators with experience working cases of unexplained disappearances of young children using canine detention dogs. Despite all this, within the first five days, police could not produce any leads. Investigations were then shifted to focus on suspicious cars seen parked on the road leading to the residence where William had disappeared. The cars, which were also noticed by William's mother, were unknown to the closely knit community and had not been seen since the young boy disappeared. Struggling to find any logic as to why these two cars would be parked on the street before William vanished, police began to view these vehicles as suspicious. At around the same time that the children were riding bicycles, a green or gray sedan drove by the Tyrell home, did a U-turn, and exited the street. 
At about the time William disappeared, another vehicle was seen driving along the street, and later that same day, the same vehicle was seen speeding down another street nearby. After clearing the Tyrell family of any involvement in William's disappearance, the police began to believe that he was most likely abducted by an opportunistic pedophile or one linked to a pedophile ring. This wasn't too far-fetched as, at the time of his disappearance, there were approximately 20 registered sex offenders residing in the surrounding area, but no arrests have been made and all deny any involvement. Over 600 people have been interviewed as persons of interest so far, raising the likelihood that detectives may have already interviewed the persons involved. On September 12, 2016, a reward of $1 million was offered for the recovery of William. This is significant as it represents the largest ever award offered to find a missing person in New South Wales history. Despite all efforts, police have so far been unable to determine what happened to William. The police are treating the case as though William is still alive, and it will remain this way until definitive evidence to the contrary is discovered.